growing up in town in Dubbo, I didn't grow up on a farm. I didn't learn about cattle through all my years at home. It's all been learnt since I finished school pretty well. You know, dad, dad was a builder, my grandfather was a builder, and you know, the obvious career path was probably to become a builder. And started showing a few cows and we had school and um, it started off as like a small passion and then just turned into a big passion or an obsession as my wife might say. Hello and welcome to Propagate, the podcast devoted to young farmers and fishers. Today it's time to jump in the ute with Brad Kavanagh. Originally from Dubbo, Brad has followed his obsession for Angus cattle all around the world. He now runs the Hard Hat Angus Stud in Harden, New South Wales, while also working full-time on the Oxton Park family farm, which has been in his wife Jess's family for generations. So how does the son of a builder wind up running a cattle stud? Yeah, well, I was working in Dubbo in a stock and station agency, which I really enjoyed that role. I'd I'd got back from America uh, at the end of 2010, where I'd had a really... Uh, interesting 12 months over there, learning a lot about, um, you know, stud Angus cattle and, and working, you know, with some pretty renowned cattle breeders in the US. So I, so I came back quite inspired with a lot of energy to, to um, you know, make our cattle business um, flourish. And, yeah, we were still quite small back then. So I, I started working as a stock station agent in Dubbo where I learned a lot about doing business and, you know, working with clients all day, every day. And yeah, it just kind of got to the point where I either had to commit to doing that and making a career out of it, you know, whereas my passion was really in, you know, managing land and animals and more hands-on agriculture rather than rather than the uh, marketing side. So we made the, we were kind of looking around at a few other jobs and yeah, I was just ended up com- communicating with Oxton Park, and they said, "Well, if you if you're looking around for other work, come and talk to us, and we'll see see where it leads to." And um, yeah, it's been you know, a great decision for us as far as you know, raising a family. We've got three young kids now, and and living living on the farm. It's a um, great lifestyle to bring up a family and. Um, yeah, we kind of haven't looked back since we've moved down here. You mentioned before that you sort of split your time between the two places. So how does that work? Yeah, well, my full-time employment is with Oxton Park, the, the family, the extended family farm. Yeah, now we've bought 800 acres there next door to the to Oxton Park. That's where we we run the, the Angus stud down here. So it's pretty much a after hours type set up where you know we spend a lot of weekends doing the cattle jobs you know after work and before work sometimes through busy periods probably 80 percent of my time would be be with the oxen park farm and probably 20 percent with the with the angus stud so uh, we've kind of refined the scale of the stud a bit through the drought you know we're pushing up to probably 300 stud cows moving into the late 2017 and you know with the drought and the high costs of uh, maintaining a, a breeding herd through that time and you know limited adjustment or no adjustment anywhere we, we've relied on in the past to build our business we just had to you know do, do whatever we had to do to make it work really and so we're back to about 150 stud cows now probably a more sustainable number with the amount of land we've got you know without relying on adjustment um, and also makes it a lot more manageable with my commitment to Oxen Park as well. How did you feel, like you say, marrying into a family? Yeah, no, it is an interesting concept and where traditionally all the members um, of the business had the O'Connor surname and moving down here, hoping that one day you'll kind of get the opportunity. I think you've just got to um, upskill yourself enough that you know, hopefully that they need you as much as you need them, really. So that's probably been a, a big part of it, you know, learning the role and um, specialising in in sheep as well as my other um, skills in cattle, just so that I can I can help their business, you know, as much as I can, so that, you're, like, you're an asset to them and it kind of works both ways. So also just takes, you know, the, the, the cattle business is um, probably not to a scale where you can not have any other off-farm income as well so 
I think we've just we've got the proportions right where we can make it work. Um, still working for Oxen Park and then putting all my extra time into making the cattle business as strong as it can be, which has been a challenge like through this drought. Yeah, just finding a way to, to, to make it all make it all work. You know, we said before that you can kind of get up get hang up on trying to have everything perfect but you kind of just send yourself mad really when when you have got as much on your plate as we do that sometimes you just got to be happy with what you can get done and not get too hang up, hung up on some of the minor things that you, you'd like to do better but it doesn't always happen that's a pretty zen approach to life and business make peace with the things you can't control and focus on just making it work. But Brad's not really a take it easy and go with the flow kind of guy. He's building a business while working full time and raising a young family. So why does he sacrifice all of this limited spare time to try and build the hard hat business? It's all about the cows. Talk me through the Angus. It's almost a love affair. Yeah, it is. And it's quite hard to explain how it happened other than that through my exposure to the Angus breed in my youth, um, it's like it was a, a learned behaviour that being in the right place at the right time and being around Angus youth for a few years there from, you know, 16 or 17 years up to early 20s, it was just a, a formative period of my life that really just set, set the course. So other teenage boys are obsessed with football and motorbikes and girls. You're like, man, these Angus... Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, like before that, I was quite obsessed with sports and stuff and probably my ability just limited, you know, I kind of didn't really like doing things I wasn't very good at. So junior sport was great, a lot of fun. Once I started getting, you know, 15 years and above, I just, yeah, kind of thought I found something that I was interested in with the cattle and, um, you know, the opportunities were there to learn and, get better and better and better and probably just where I saw the opportunity rather than, you know, all the sporting and a lot of my friends are still heavily involved in sport through all those years, but I was going to cattle shows on weekends. So what is it about those black cows? They're very well suited to our environment. They fit in, they're, they're like an all round breed for, for what we do. So the, the female cows are, are very well suited to, to our area. They're great mothers, highly fertile high calving ease in the majority of the Angus cattle. The growth of the Angus breed is, is very strong as well. So, you know, the majority of the commercial cattle operations will be getting paid cents per kilo, so kilos is important. And then the, the carcass side of it, so yeah, the end point merit of, of the Angus breed is probably second to none. You know, there's, some, there's a few other breeds that are right up there, similar, but the fact that we're the whole package, you know, we're high, high marbling, some high yielding carcasses as well. The maintenance requirement of our females is, um, you know, through most breeding operations is quite low. We like a pretty moderate weight female. So the, the input costs are a bit lower than, than if they were more higher and extreme in mature cow weight. Um, so it was just a complete package, I think, of the, the Angus breed that pushed me towards it, along with all the, the uh, educational opportunities through my youth that really just set that path. What was American farming like? It was highly contrasting. So I was based in Pennsylvania, quite small acreages, very intensive agriculture. Like we had 600 cows and calves on as many acres, I think. You feed them through the winter and, you know, you get a bit of a relief in the spring, summer when they go out on pasture and then they're back in, you know, once the, once the summer cuts out. Contrasted to out in, uh, you know, the Montanas and the Wyomings where it's big, large parcels of land, um, rage land like sagebrush country in Wyoming which I was exposed to a bit because um, a lot of the Sinclair cattle company cattle ran out there which was great so I had a couple of trips out there you know looking at cattle visiting some clients and looking at some embryo transfer calves on different places in Pennsylvania it was highly intensive high intervention type stuff you know a cow only got a cough, cough a couple of times and she'd cop an antibiotic whereas in the West, it's the opposite. You know, they fend for themselves. They've got that high environmental test on the cattle out there. And, you know, through history, that's where a lot of the dominant genetics have, have come out of those areas where they get that big environmental test and the either genetics really shine through on which ones, you know, can handle it, which ones can't. Such a massive industry over there that, 
you know, you get a successful bull and there's literally thousands and thousands of car, like um, progeny used by that bull, big, big um, commercial heifer AI projects over there, which is, which is a really um, impressive thing and how they kind of get their genetic gain in the US. Um, I absolutely loved it over there and, you know, for a fair while we were going back there and going to try and make it our home, but it kind of wasn't meant to be and, yeah, we moved on to here, so. Yeah, no. They um, they've got nothing to complain about at the moment. Those those heifers they've they've had a good run on the grazing crop for a couple of months and yeah, they've just been joined in in the autumn and um, yeah, no, all the cattle are in magnificent condition at the moment and um, which is good. We've got our bull sale coming up in September, so that's kind of the biggest KPI of the year is that day and if hopefully um, we can bring it all together. How do you prepare for such a thing? A lot of it comes down to um, customer support and communication, you know, throughout the year. You know, and it's, it's something I, I struggle with a little bit because we're, we're pretty busy most of the time with, with other commitments. I'm not, you, you don't, we don't live in this perfect world, so things will eventually, like occasionally you'll get something that'll go wrong with your cattle. As much as you do genetically to try and alleviate that, things go wrong. So you want to have a great relationship with your customers so that when something goes wrong, you're the first one that hears about it and you get an opportunity to fix it. That's probably a big part of part of it. It's like a year-round support that we give our, our customers, whether it's a text message to say, well, there's a really great price on this particular type of animal where, that out there at the moment, you know, and if you've got any stock that might fit that market, well, it's a, there's a good, um, good price there for you. Um, to just, you know, seeing how their pre-testing rates were, you know, and, and like the vast majority of it's all highly positive feedback we get and you know any negative stuff well you just got to fix the problem they might come over they might not when a client comes here do they actually know what they want or do they almost know what they want oh some more than others um you know some people well researched very passionate about it um others might be you know sheep and wheat farmers that have got a few cows and you know just want calves so there's all 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 variables you know in that side of it um but, you know we try and just give give a full service you know and you know, if people are interested in, in knowing why we do what we do, well then, yeah, we're more than happy to talk them through the whole process. So, whereas other people, you know, they, they do what they do for a particular reason. And, um, you know, it's just about identifying what genetics fit in with their operation and try and point out to them what I think will work best. Because at the end of the day, like, we've been around these cattle since the day they were born and um, got a good grasp of the the different genetic lines in each bull and how they've performed in the past and um, you know we've got a good idea how they're going to perform for them so you do tend to do a lot of communication and you, you sort of almost promote these guys yeah well that's it's definitely part of it we try and have the cattle right that you know if someone turns up to look at the cattle well then the cattle sell themselves after that but you still got to get them here yeah, you know, it's a, it's quite a competitive business. You can open the land or whatever any week, and there'll be hundreds of ads for people trying to sell black Angus cattle. It's just you know identifying your point of difference, and that was probably always part of the business plan. Was that you know one of the negatives always was that there's so many black bulls around, but it's about um, for me it's probably just about having confidence in in our in our ability. You know we're, we're well researched and we. We've done the hard work and confidence you can, there's, you can do it better than some others. Does it ever get quite cutthroat in terms of 
people offering amazing deals and sweet weekends and bottles of wine and things like that? Or? I think there'd definitely be some of that in it. Us being a relatively new stud, you know, we don't really have the resources to go down that path. So, you know, our cattle have got to do the business for us. So at the end of the day, it's about, you know, improving the profitability of our customers. You know, so your genetics have got to do that. And, and often, you know, the biggest, fattest bull that might go get dragged around to the shows or, you know, whatever, he, he might not be the bull that will do that. You look at him and you might think he will, but... It's about breaking it down and, you know, what's been the management of that bull from, from when he was born, you know, and, and also identifying programs that you've got a lot of confidence in the, the people and the people behind the program to source our genetics from as well. Let's say someone pulls up and they come out and they say, let's have a look what you got. What sort of money would they be talking about dropping potentially? Oh, mate, well, our sale bulls last year averaged 6000 each. Um, you know, we sell paddock bulls for 4000 so, um, for example, this year, 55 bulls in the, the end drop, which are these blokes here, rising two-year-old. Um, like we'll catalogue 35 for the sale, so they'll be the top 35 bulls will be in the sale. And then, uh, you know, we have the lesser bulls um, that are available for clients that, you know, they jo join before our bull sale and they just need the bulls. So we're in the business of selling bulls, so we've got to got to keep that in mind as well and, and let them know that, you know, the best bulls are going to be in the sale. So you, if you want those, you've got to compete for them. But, um, well, yeah, you know, consider them in the sale. But um, we still try and get our genetics out there as much as we can. It's a really interesting aspect of the business, the getting of genetics out there. It's like the old saying, you don't sell the steak, you sell the sizzle. So it got me wondering about whether Brad is trying to sell cattle or sell genetics. Well, it was the genetics until the 2017 drought. It was a massive equaliser and reality check that, you know, it was fine to have all these cattle, but, you know, while there was adjustment around, but when the adjustment runs out, like pretty much everywhere, you're in deep trouble. And that's where we found ourselves. So you kind of stud cattle, you need them, you know, presented quite well. You need to be able to allow the people to see what the genetics do, you know. If you've got cattle that are always restricted by their environment, you know, you can have the best genetics in the world, but if they're malnourished, you can't see it. So part of, you know, having a successful stud, I think, is being able to present them in a, in a condition where people can see the genetic expression of your cattle, because if they can't see it, well, you know, you're going to struggle. With all the numbers in the world, like with all the genetic data in the world, people want to see, you know, what the cattle can do. And as many people that turn up and want to buy skinny bulls, like they don't actually buy them. <laughs> it's like a car yard. They still want shiny cars. Exactly. But more so, they want shiny cars with the genetics behind them. I suppose you just got to be, got to get to the point where you're confident that people are coming to you to, to buy their, buy your cattle because they like you and they like what you, what you stand for. And I think once you get your head around that, you know, you don't have to be that used car salesman. You just can be honest, you say, you tell them how it is and, you know, warts and all. And, you know, show them your, your top cattle, show them the ones you're not happy with. Because that's a fact, like, you're not, you're always going to have cattle that you're not happy with. Even even once you get rid of all your bad ones, you know, there's still going to be ones that you like and, you know, a couple of faults in one. And I think it's important that you identify with your clients, you know, that, you know, that this is a fault in that bull. He, he's got a lot to offer, but he's not perfect just so that they know exactly what it is that they're buying. You've got the university study as well behind you. So, I mean, which, which one do you think you lean on more, the university or the traditional learning? Probably 60 traditional, 40 university, I reckon. Yep. No, I think the university education is, like, extremely vital. and Well, it doesn't have to be university education, but just the theory of the genetic theory and, like, it's very critical as to what we're doing. But as far as, um, you know surviving like getting through these hard times it's, i think it's the traditional learning and the theory can come unstuck you know with all the different variables you know you can you can plan and think it's you've got it sorted and you know you get a curveball and there's a few variables there's a lot of variables yeah if you were doing financials on the past couple of years well you'd you'd never do it but you know if 
the years before that, you know, when we were, we were still only building the business, so it's not, never been like a highly profitable business, but just the, the cost burden of the last two years of drought, you know, if you were to factor that into your financials as to happen, you know, a couple of years in five, you wouldn't do it. Because you've, um, you have taken big steps to, you know, get your own land and things like that. Mm. So what, what's behind that drive? Because you probably could have made a pretty good living working for other people for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's, uh, I think it's partly to do with the way I'm wired a bit. When I had five cows, I wanted 10 and, you know, that type of mentality that's kind of been curved a bit the last couple of years, but um, it's kind of still there. It's just um, been dinted. Yeah, I think that's just, uh, yeah, the way, the way I am. What makes you happy about this gig? I think the satisfaction of um, breeding what you're trying to breed, I think. You know, there's, you get a lot of satisfaction out of um, hearing feedback, you know, that your cattle have done wonders for someone's operation, you know, where they need a lot of help, a lot of improvement in a certain area and they've come to you and, you know, you've said your bulls are going to do this and then they do it, you know, which is, which is really good. Also get a lot of satisfaction, I think, out of spending weekends with the cattle, with Jess and the kids, and, like, they just love it. You know, there's a lot of, that's probably a big part of everything we do as well, that, you know, setting up something that maybe our kids might want to be involved in and or have the option to be involved in if they wanted to, you know, and just giving them, you know, all the basics, like it's a, being involved in animals, you know, it's, you, you kind of get a fair, fair education on the circle of life pretty early on that you don't get when you're living in town. I didn't get, it's a, it's a really good upbringing and, you know, we get a lot of satisfaction out of, you know, driving around the cattle with the kids and having them involved. Brad didn't grow up on a farm, but his kids definitely are. I wonder if they'll be as tenacious about agriculture as he is. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Propagate, which is brought to you by the Cowboys and Cowgirls at the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries Young Farmer Business Program. If you'd like to lasso yourself some more episodes, you can download the entire first season wherever you get your podcasts. My name's Corey Haig. Thanks for listening.